They are the most vast and vital bodies of fresh water on Earth. The North American Great Lakes, Ontario, Erie, Michigan, Huron, Superior. Their shorelines, a mystical meeting place of rocks and trees and water. But beyond the peaceful lakeside lies an alien world of chilling depths and sudden violent storms. A world where even the mightiest of vessels can be devoured by the fury of the waves. Six thousand ships have been lost on the Great Lakes in the four centuries since Europeans first came to trade along their shores. This is the haunting tale of the largest victim of them all, a ship built of steel to carry steel, yet not strong enough to endure the fierce November gales of Lake Superior, a waterway that became a graveyard for 29 men, waters that never surrender their dead. The legend lives on from the Chippewa on down of the big lake they call Gitchagumi. The lake, it is said, never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. With a load of iron ore, 26,000 tons more than the Edmund Fitzgerald weighed empty. That good ship and true was a bone to be chewed when the gales of November came early. In June 1995, a small fleet gathers 20 miles offshore from Whitefish Point on Michigan's Upper Peninsula. It is a mission of investigation, resurrection, and completion. The raising of the bell from one of the most mysterious and devastating wrecks in the history of the Great Lakes, the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Canadian naval ship Cormorant carries two mini submarines. The Anglican lady brings an array of sophisticated electronic gear to control the newt suit, a high-tech innovation that allows a diver to work for hours hundreds of feet below the surface. The expedition is led by Emery Kristoff, eminent underwater photographer, and Tom Farnquist of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum. Well, we were asked by the family members who lost their loved ones aboard the Fitzgerald, we wouldn't help them out a bit. Uh, one thing is they wanted to establish a memorial at Whitefish Point to remember the family members. And one thing led to another, and the bell was suggested as a, a likely uh, piece of hardware that would really have some connection to the Fitzgerald itself. The divers will try to remove the old bell and make it the centerpiece of a memorial to the men who died. Then they will replace it on the wreck with a new bell engraved with the names of the lost crew of the ship they called Big Fitz. My brother uh, who died on the Fitzgerald was the oldest. He was a year and about a year and a half older than I. And when my father died when we were very young, he took over the family. He was 13 years old, but he was a man of the family. He told me the night before I left to go to Vietnam that if anything happened to me over there, he would come and get me. And I've tried now for all these years to bring him home to come and get him. And I, I, this is as close as I can get. I can't do it anymore. I know I won't be able to bring him home, but I've tried, and this is the best I can do. The 
story begins on an autumn morning with almost surreal warmth and calm as the freighter Edmund Fitzgerald sails toward the port of Superior, Wisconsin to take on a load of iron ore for the auto factories of the East. It is November 9, 1975, the beginning of the Fitzgerald's 40th voyage in her 17th year of service. She had been christened in 1958. At 729 feet long and 75 feet wide, she was the champion of the lakes. For the next 17 years, she would set records for carrying the heaviest loads and for the fastest run ever by a ship her size. But on November 10th, 1975, well into what would become her last voyage, those records mean little. As the Big Fitz heads east across Lake Superior, an intense storm system takes hold. Carrying 26,000 tons of iron ore, she's riding low. At 3.10 in the afternoon, Fitzgerald's captain, Ernest McSorley, reports the first sign of trouble to the freighter Arthur M. Anderson. About seven miles behind, the Anderson has been following the Fitzgerald since the night before. Captain McSorley radios Captain Bernie Cooper reporting some topside damage and a starboard list. Now that immediate list again tells me that he either had a stress fracture or he bottomed out. I asked him if he had any pumps on, he said yes. And later on he, he said that he wasn't gaining anything by pumping out on it, so the water was coming in the hole as fast as they were pumping it out. 4 p.m., the winds are nearly 100 miles an hour. At 4.10, Captain McSorley reports his radar masts have been disabled. He's now sailing blind with 30-foot waves coming over her decks. 6.40 p.m., just clear of Caribou Island, the Anderson is rocked by two gigantic waves in rapid succession. 35-foot towers of water crash down on the ship. The Anderson survives, but waves as powerful as those found in a mid-ocean cyclone are bearing down on the Edmund Fitzgerald from behind. In a few minutes, they will catch up to her. At 7.10 p.m., Ernest McSorley gets a final position fix from the Anderson. Morgan Clark asks how the Edmund Fitzgerald is faring. Ernest McSorley replies, we are holding our own. Those are the last words from the Edmund Fitzgerald. At 7.30, the snow eases. Bernie Cooper searches the horizon for the lights of the Fitzgerald, but there are no lights. The radar screen aboard Anderson shows nothing. The big Fitz has disappeared. An air and sea search turn up only bits of debris and no sign of the 29-man crew. They vanished. In the summer of 1995, the final mission descends into Superior's black depths. The purpose? To recover the ship's bell to once again hear the voice of the Edmund Fitzgerald. A year earlier, Harbor Branch Oceanographic and the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum explored the wreck site using a mini submarine. So when relatives of the Fitzgerald crew asked later that year to raise the bell, museum director Tom Farnquist knew it could be done. After months of planning, the Canadian Navy prepares its two mini subs for the job. Working in partnership with the newt suit, the almost surgical removal of the bell begins. Okay, make it hot. It's hot. It's still hot. Still hot. Still hot. Still. I got a cold. After a long night of preparation with many of the Fitzgerald relatives watching, the final work begins. It is July 4th. Get 
taken to the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Museum at Whitefish Point. In its place, a new brass bell, inscribed with the names of the 29 men who died, will become an eternal memorial, returned forever to the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Also, come down the bell. Perfect. Perfect. Perfect, Bruce. Nice work. Power down. We pray that this bell that goes down on this ship will be a sign to everyone to remember the dignity of this place and keep it a place of gentle solitude. It is with great pride and a great deal of humility that I present this bell on behalf of the people of Ontario to the people of Michigan and especially to the families of the Edmund Fitzgerald crew. The men deserve the memorial. They should have had it a long time ago, but they finally got it. Being out there on that spot gave me peace of mind because the sun was shining, the sky was clear, the water was beautiful, and it just it filled that void for me. To Tom Farnquist, we can't put into words our gratitude and heartfelt thanks for all you've done. As we remember the men, as we hear the bell toll, we should grieve. But we should also not forget, we should not forget to celebrate their lives as well. As the bell is in their hearts, so they are in the bell. And in the bell's tone are the voices of the men, and we should listen. Ernest M. McSorley, Master. First Mate, John H. McCarthy. Euler, Thomas Benson. Deckhand, Bruce L. Hudson. Church bell Second Assistant Engineer, Russell G. Pascal. Cadet of the Deck, David E. Weiss. Superior, they said, never gives up the dead when the gales of come early. Third Assistant Engineer, Oliver J. Shampoo. The 30th ring, and it is for all the mariner sailors who have lost their lives on the Great Lakes. <laughs> <laughs> 